October 2014, FM Walleyes hosted legendary angler, PWT champion, and a member of the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame, Ted Takasaki. Now here to introduce Ted is FM Walleyes President, Scotty Brewer. All right. Speaking of great tournaments, great tournament anglers, our speaker tonight. Where do we start? Hall of Fame, freshwater fishing Hall of Fame, legendary angler. What year was that you were inducted, Tim? I don't know. A few, few years ago? <laughs> Trust me, that is not an easy thing to do. I mean, not at all. He's fished the MWC, the FLW, the PWT, and pretty much every major wallet tournament circuit out there. He's won probably at least one tournament in every one of them circuits. 1998 PWT champion, 1995 Top Gun Award for the PWT, he's won the Mercury Nationals. He was president of Lindy Tackle Company. I think some of you guys may have heard of Lindy Tackle, they've been around for a little while. He was president of them for about 10 years. He has done magazines, a lot of, a lot of writing. You got a buddy that he writes with? Mr. Richardson. TV shows radio, seminars, but you know what, Ted's greatest accomplishment, which a lot of you guys probably don't know, he is one half of a poker player. Or at least he thinks he is. All in. Go on all in. Ted loves poker and we love playing with Ted. It's a love-hate relationship. All right, so Teddy's going to talk to us about how we're going to find fish on a tough bite, which none of us ever experience that situation because we know Minnesota lakes, I mean, they just stop and drop your line over and bam, you got to limit this thing. Um, quite often, quite often, more than quite often, it's a very tough bite. And Teddy's going to use some of his knowledge and experience to show us some tricks that uh, will help us get over that hump and put a couple extra fish in the boat. So give a round of applause to uh, the great Ted Thompson. Well, it's great to be here in Fargo, I tell you what. I've got some of my very best friends in this room tonight, and I love coming here to Fargo. And not only that, but you know, a fishing club like FM Walleyes, I mean, this is where you really do learn from other folks in the club. You know, I mean, you do have some of the greatest anglers and the greatest poker players in this room. <laughs> I love playing poker with these guys and fishing against them as well. So it's just great to be here. And, uh, you know, we all talk about tough bites, right? Has anybody ever, ever experienced one of those days? <laughs> of course, everybody has. There's always a tough bite no matter where you go, you know, there's going to be a cold front day or, you know, the wind isn't blowing, you know, the water's clear. Those are always kind of the, the, the tough kind of bites, right? So what I wanted to do tonight is talk a little bit about what you might do to try to overcome that. So the first thing I wanted to start with is give you the best piece of advice that I could ever give you. And if you leave this room tonight, and remember this piece of advice, I think you go a long way to catching more fish in the future. And that is, the fish are always biting somewhere on something every single day. Alright? So, what does that do if you tell yourself that at all times that the fish are always biting? What does that make you do? It makes you change the spot, change a tactic, maybe downsize, maybe speed up a little bit, you know? I, I've got buddies that come, that'll go out and then, you know, he'll look at Joe and he'll say, they'll, they'll drop the lines down for about five minutes and say, well, fish aren't biting yet today, are they? And then Joe says, no, I don't think so. So they, boom, 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 they go right back to the launch ramp, go to Maury's Fish Market, buy walleyes and take them home, right? I mean, 
That, the, the, the first thing to overcome a tough bite is, first of all, tell yourself the fish are always biting. Okay? Once you tell yourself that, it gives you that positive, that mental capacity to keep on trying. And why do I know that the fish are always biting? I've fished over 25 years, hundreds of tournaments. And in every single one of those tournaments, there hasn't been one tournament yet where no fish has been caught by everybody. Not one. All right? So what does that tell you? That tells you that there is somebody that is, caught, that is always on fish at every single tournament. That means that there is a fish to be caught somewhere on something. So that's the first thing that I want to get across to everybody. All right? Fish are always biting. Now, when it comes to a tough bite, you know, typically you talk about cold fronts, right? I mean, cold front is like the kiss of death, right? And how do you determine what a cold front is? And, you know, fishing is dictated a lot by weather. So I think what I'd like to do is give everybody a real short weather lesson as well. Because, you know, we always go out, we always look at the weather, we look at the news reports and the weather reports and see what the next day is going to bring us, right? That's what we do when we're tournament fishing all the time. So when it comes to weather, we're dictated by low pressure and high pressure systems, right? A low pressure system swirls, the, the winds swirl this way, right? Okay? Usually, um, as the low pressure comes in, you get southerly winds, right? And then all of a sudden, as it comes past, usually they go west to east. As that low pressure swings by, now what follows that? A high pressure. High pressure, usually the wind comes around this. And then you got a strong north northwest wind. You got that front that comes through, a real strong, you know, storm of some sort. You know, you got the rain and the lightning. And then as soon as that clears out, the, the air temperature drops 10 to 15 degrees. And then all of a sudden you got bright, sunny, clear blue skies and dead calm conditions. Anybody experienced that before? <laughs> that is your cold front. The cold front is that clear blue, low humidity, dead calm kind of day. And, uh, you know, the water temperature drops, you know, maybe in four, five, six degrees. You know, I, I mean, I am not going to tell you that, it, that you're going to always be able to catch fish every single time you go out, no matter what you do sometimes, you know. But those are very, very tough days, no doubt about that. All right, it makes it, it shuts the fish off. Why do why do those high pressure cold front days shut the fish off? And I've talked to fish biologists and weather guys who fish, and this is this is really what happens. A high pressure system as it comes in, the high pressure is exactly that. It's like a hand pressing on the surface of the water. And when, you know, like on those low pressure system, you can, you can actually see the fish come off the bottom and swimming around, right? When you're marking fish six inches to a foot and a half off the bottom on a, on a piece of structure, a hump or a point, those are active, aggressive fish for me. I'm going to stick around and try to, try to catch those fish. Now, that's right before that front, you know, when you got the wind blowing and, you know, you got that humidity and it's a nice south, southwest wind. Those are usually the best fishing days, okay? A little bit of cloud cover. Those fish are six inches to a foot and a half off the bottom. Now, as soon as that front comes through and that storm blows through and you got those high bluebirds, clear blue skies, and that high pressure settles into that system and, and the air temperature drops and the water temperature drops, what happens to those fish? You just go boof, right down to the bottom, okay? And, it, and basically what it is, it's because it's like a big hand. That high pressure system is pushing on the surface of the water, and those fish can actually feel that pressure. You know, it'd be like, would anybody be hungry if, if uh, you know, Tom Backer was sitting on their stomach? <laughs> See, I can say that because Tom's not here. <laughs> But nobody would be hungry if somebody was sitting on your stomach, right? That's exactly what the fish experience during, during a cold front, high pressure system as it comes through. 
right. But anyway, so, so that's why fish don't, they just don't react. They're just not as active and aggressive during a cold front situation. So how do you overcome that, all right? Typically what I like to do when it comes to cold front conditions is you either really slow down and downsize. Okay, that's the first thing I would start doing. Like if you're, if you're snap jigging on Leech Lake, you know, what I might do then is start slowing down. Slow down and slow down and downsize, right? And then if that's not working, then you start speeding up and try to get a reaction bite. And that's kind of what this all this jigging wrap kind of stuff is doing right now is that it's an ice fishing lure that a lot of people are using in open water situations. And when you snap that lure, it darts and boom, it creates a reaction strike. So, you know, when you're thinking about these cold front conditions, just go to the opposite extremes of what you normally do, okay? It's kind of like a time, I remember a, a time many years ago, I took my daughter out fishing out on Leech Lake. And uh, it was one of those cold front days, you know, and I was really excited about taking her out so she can catch, you know, some nice walleyes and she's all excited. You know how it is when you take your kids out, right? You want to put them on fish. Well, we got out there this day and it was a cold front, you know, clear blue skies, you know, and, and I still, but then we had a little bit of chop on the water, so that, I was excited about that. So we got out there in the water and we started fishing from point to point to point and we were working them jigs, snapping them, snapping them, and then dragging them and dragging them. You'd kind of bring that jig in and then stop, bring it in, stop. You know, you try to use a lot of different actions when you're jig fishing or when you're trolling crankbaits. You know, change the speed and change the direction are the two best tips that I can give you to trigger bites. All right? You don't want to throw a crankbait out and just start reeling it in. All right? Throw that crankbait out, give it a couple quick swipes, and then start bringing it in. And as that crankbait gets in close to the boat, give it a quick rip, and then let it pause for a split second. I've caught a lot of fish, not only walleyes, but muskies, doing that one little trick. All right? What happens, I think, is have you ever reeled through a crankbait out, reel it back to the boat, lift it up, and there's that fish looking at you? Right? Where'd, where'd that minnow go? Okay? I've caught a lot of fish just by giving that little rod tip a little whoop, and that crankbait goes and let it pause for a split second before you take it out of the water. All right? But anyway, my daughter, we were out there fishing and it was a tough, tough day. I mean, we went from spot to spot to spot, trying to catch fish, you know, and doing everything we could with that jig and just nothing was happening. It got to be about noon, all right? My daughter, you know, my daughter's, she's getting hungry. So the best tip that I can give you when you take kids out fishing, take a lot of food, all right? They love food. So if things are slow, you just shove them a candy bar, you know, or give them a sandwich or whatever it may be, right? So my daughter, she puts the rod underneath her seat. She's sitting on the seat, you know, reaches into the, into the cooler, grabs a sandwich and starts eating a sandwich. And then all of a sudden, that rod tip's going boom, boom, boom. Chrissy, get that fish. She leans over, grabs that fish, three pound walleye. And oh my God, that's incredible. Christy, what were you, how'd you catch that fish? What were you doing? And she said, eating a sandwich. <laughs> so I said, eat another one. <laughs> so this time I'm watching her, right? So she puts that rod underneath the seat, she reaches over, grabs the sandwich, starts eating another sandwich. Boom, 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 two pound wall. I go, guess what we did the rest of the day? We ate sandwiches. <laughs> you know, it sounds funny, right? But what it was is that she, all she did is just had that rod just sitting there. It wasn't moving. We had anchored up to, to have lunch and all those walleyes wanted was no movement at all. Just sitting right over the side of the boat. And the rest of the day, all we did is just anchor and throw the rods and rod holders, and we proceeded to really catch a lot of fish that day. So when you catch that first fish, what I want you to do is to think about what it took to catch that fish, okay? What triggered that fish to bite? 
Once you figure out what triggered that fish to bite, that will lead to the next one and then to the next one. Then you can start eliminating, is it color, is it the action, is it uh, whatever it may be. Okay. Now what I always like to do is run through a list of what's really important. Okay. The first thing I always think when it comes to fishing is location. Right? That's the most important thing. Where you are on that lake. Is it on a tip of a point? Is it on a hump? Is it in mud flats? Right? So location is first. The next thing is action. It's the action of the crankbait, the speed you're going, the change of speed, the change of direction. That's why when, whenever I'm trolling, I like to speed up, I like to slow down, I like to turn left, I like to turn right, you know? That, all, that, all that does is just change the speed and change the direction of your lure. Plus the crank, you know, the crankbait might charge a little bit more. Every single crankbait's got a little bit different action. Okay? So those are, those are the things to consider after location. The next thing, all right, color. Anybody believe color makes a big difference? It can. It's not as important as location or action. But after, after those two, color, I do believe, can make a difference. But the funny thing about color, this is kind of what I always kind of hypothesize a little bit, is that, you know, in my boat, you know, on Erie, I could be catching fish on purple and blue, right? I mean, just after going through all the colors, you know, I find out that purple and blue is the only color that you can catch fish on. And then I call a buddy and say, hey, we're catching on purple and blue, and, you know, and he says, all we're catching them on is chartreuse fire tiger. We can't catch them on purple and blue. You know, so I'm not sure if this school of fish is a little different than that school of fish. You know, I mean, maybe this one's colorblind and the other one's not. I'm not sure what it is. But I still am not 100% confident that color is that, that important. It can be, but, you know, it's not as important as location and the action that you put on the lure, okay? After that, you know, sound, I think that rattles. You know, if I'm gonna pick out two different crankbaits to start off with, probably pick out rattles before I wouldn't, you know? So I think that's, that sound does make a little bit of a difference. I've talked to scuba divers that go down underneath the water and they'll be sitting there, they might click some rocks together and all of a sudden a small mouth will come swim, swimming in or a walleye come in. So I think that, that sound can make a difference. Then after that would be scent, right? That would be at the bottom. So those are the things that I always think about whenever I go through a checklist of what I want to do to, to catch fish, okay? So on a cold front, go faster or go slower. You know, downsize or try to create a reaction straight. Those are the things I think about. Now, let's talk about clear water conditions. That's another, you know, gotcha sometimes when it comes to walleye fishing. Isn't that right? When it comes to a tough bite, when you get real clear water, you know, again, maybe calm, calm weather. I love wind when it comes to Minnesota lakes. I believe that if you've got a day where you can choose the calm side of the lake or the windy side of the lake, I'm going to try to pick the windy side of the lake first especially in clear water conditions. And, you know, certainly there's a lot of lakes that are known for nighttime fishing, right? And most of us fish during the day, and certainly the tournaments are always conducted during the day, so you gotta learn how to catch the fish during the day, right? And these real clear water lakes are, are sometimes very tough to catch fish during, during the day. Now, this is the one thing that I have found in every single Minnesota lake when it comes to clear water and maybe nighttime oriented fish, fish the weeds. There is no doubt in my mind that Minnesota lakes are in clear water, it, it, they're all weed oriented fish. But definitely fish the weeds. And how do you fish the weeds? Probably the two best techniques to, to fish the weeds would be a bullet sinker and a, a spinner rig, a night, crawler's, uh, night crawler. 
Okay. You can work that, that bullet sinker and that nightcrawler harness right on the edges of the weeds. And, uh, you know, Lake Okoboji is one, that's where I caught my very first walleye, was Lake Okoboji. It's a very clear water lake, a lot of weed lines. And that's how, the, that's how they always, they catch a lot of different kinds of fish along weed lines when it comes to uh, clear water conditions. So it's either that or maybe toss jigs and plastic into the pockets and sometimes you just work them and then you get hung up, you just rip it and then let it sit back down, rip it again, let it sit back down. In that case, you know, you probably be wanting to use a little bit stiffer or stouter rod and um, a super braid, a super braided line, okay? Um, the super braids are a lot thinner, they're very strong, you always get your jig back, you rip, sometimes rip right through those weeds and cut the weeds, okay? So those are a couple tips for real clear water conditions, okay? Now, sometimes, you know, when these fish are, you know, on these humps, you know, slip bobbers. Anybody like to fish slip bobbers? There's no doubt. Minnesota lakes, slip bobbers really go well together, right? A lot of times what you got to do is just keep that fit, that, that bait right for the nose for a period of time. Now, usually when, when I'm still fishing, like with slip bobbers, when you're anchored in slip bobber, you want to fish some sort of structure, okay, something that concentrates the fish. General rule of thumb, when it comes to um, either trolling or stationary fishing, right? So let's, let's talk about some, some rules that you use there. If the fish are scattered or suspended, trolling or moving is usually the best way to catch them. If the fish are concentrated, usually on structure like a hump or a tip of a point, that's when you, that's when you might want to vertical fish, okay? So, Spread out, suspended, horizontal fishing, which is trolling. And then if they're concentrated, vertical fishing, which would be vertical jigging or a slip bobber, okay? Now, I just came across a slip bobber just recently here that I think is, I've never seen anything like it. This is a, you, you might have seen something like this before. Uh, there's a lot of different bobbers that are a few, a few out there that are kind of like this, but what they are is that they're this foam. It's kind of a foam and it slides, right? A lot of times they're used for ice fishing. You ever seen something like this before, right? Uh, the thing that's different about this one is that the foam comes out. Okay, so you just have the plastic attachment here on the bottom and this foam you also have these little pin-on weights. So there's a couple different size of pin-on weights on the bottom that you can, you can change the buoyancy of this particular bobber. And another neat thing about it is that when you slide the foam back in, if you just barely put it in there, it's got more buoyancy. If you slide it all the way down to the bottom of this plastic attachment, it's got less buoyancy. So we used to have to take split shots and then just keep on changing the split shots or maybe, you know, change the size of the slip bobber. With this one, you can, you can really fish a wide variety of different size jigs with this particular slip bobber. It's called a Venom Float. And like I said, I just, just came across it here uh, this last uh, sports show season. So I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it or seen it, seen it but it, it works just like a regular slip bobber, only you can change the buoyancy of it without having to cut the foam. Once, like a lot of the same type of bobbers, when you cut the foam, you can't add buoyancy back, it's already gone. But this one here, you don't cut the foam, you just move the foam up and down in this, in this little plastic attachment. It's pretty cool. And you fish it just like any other slip bobber. You got a slip bobber knot, maybe a little bead. Another nice thing about it is that they got a little thing where you can cut it. You can just take an exacto knife and just kind of cut a slit, and you can take it off if you're maybe vertical jigging and you don't want to use the slip bobber. Okay. Another thing about slip bobbers, too, how many of you use the thread knots, the, the thread slip bobber knots versus the, the plastic or the rubber beads? I, I, like the, I like the thread knots. And what I usually do 
with these is I leave about an inch or so tag ends on, on, the, on the thread itself. Right? The reason I do that is because after you move it up and down the line a few times, it gets loose. And what I do is that then at that point I can just tighten it up. Plus it's a lot easier to see as, it, as you throw the bobber out there and all of a sudden you can just see that line, that, that thread with a highly colored, I, I like to use the chartreuse threads or the orange threads and then it'll just kind of move along the, the top of the water until it hits the slip bobber and all of a sudden then the slip bobber will stand up. Okay? But I like leaving them leaving about an inch on each side just because it gives you more visibility plus you can tighten it up if you want. Another neat thing about uh, slip bobbers, this is another thing that I've done when it comes to slip bobber fishing. I use a super braid for my main line. Okay? A super braid to my main line and then down here I tie a small little barrel swivel and then I got monofilament down here and especially well when we used to fish Devil's Lake in the wood and there's not much wood there no more but if you get into real snaggy situations um, with the super braid when you when you get hung up you just pull on a super braid and what breaks is the monofilament leader down at the bottom and then you save your, your slip bobber. Okay, you know, a lot of people like to just use monofilament all the way through and then when you break it, there goes your slip bobber floating away. So with this, the super braid doesn't break, the monofilament will break, and all you have to do is just tie on another jig. All right, any questions at this point? How are we doing on time? Okay, if you do have any questions, please feel free, I mean, you know, just raise your hand. And I can, uh, I can address any questions. All right. Now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the next kind of conditions. How many of you fish rivers? Okay. Yeah, there's Mississippi River, even like the Missouri River, although it's not. I look at the Missouri River system kind of more of a, combination river and lake, right, because it's a reservoir. There's some water coming through it, but for the most part, you know, it's, a, it's still a lake. But when it comes to river fishing, what are the toughest conditions when it comes to fishing a river? Dirty water, dirty and high water, and lots of current, no doubt. In fact, the very first tournament I ever fished was on the Illinois River Mud we called it Mud Bowl 1. This was bad. <laughs> My very first tournament, you know. All right, it was back in 1989. Me and uh, my partner, John Campbell, we were all excited about fishing our first walleye tournament. We had been taking fishing classes. We'd gone to Canada for several years and caught a lot of fish up there. You know, we're thinking, hey, we're going to try this first walleye tournament. I'm sure we're going to do really good. Well, you know, the Chicago area had about four and a half inches of rain two days before the tournament, you know, before practice actually started. And by the time the first day of practice was, I mean, it was like 10 feet high. There was refrigerators and cows all floating down the river. It was all into the cornfields. And when you drop, here's my... Uh, I've got a real sophisticated way, a sophisticated way of determining how muddy the water is, right? You know, anybody have like those color selectors or any other light meters, you know, to try to figure out how dirty the water is? Well, this is really, really um, high-tech stuff here. So what I do when, I, when, I determine, when you determine how, how, water, how dirty the water is, what I do is I drop I drop the jig down until I can't see it. I reel the rod tip up to the surface of the water, and then when I lift up, if there's only this much left, that's dirty. <laughs> okay? It's pretty sophisticated, isn't it? And I tell you what, that, that Illinois River that year, you couldn't see your jig that far beneath the surface. All right? And, um, you know, the interesting thing about that tournament is that first day of practice we went out there and all we did is we looked for clear water. If we could find any water that was just a little bit clearer than the rest of it, 
That's where we started fishing. And we actually found this one little creek that was coming in. Um, after the rain came through and all the muddy water was coming through, then these smaller creeks start emptying out. You know, they aren't quite as dirty. So you get a little bit of clear water mixing in with muddy water. So that's where we started fishing. We actually caught a couple saugers in that kind of clearer water conditions. And we're thinking, all right, we got this. Well, it comes a tournament, obviously, you go to the same plots, and they're not always there, you know, for us. In fact, we didn't catch a fish in two days of that tournament. But we were tied for 13th place with 180 other, 180 something other teams. So out of 200 teams, there's like 180 something zeros. But there was still one team that caught like eight fish for the two days. So that's why I'm saying there's always some fish caught somewhere on something. They actually were able to find this one little big, big, um, it was like a dam wall. It was like a concrete wall where the current was pushing against that wall and swirled around and they just sat right behind that, that concrete wall and they were able to get out of the majority of the current. You know, and they caught, they caught eight fish, and they, they were far and away the winners of that tournament. And, uh, you know, another 10 or 12 or 11 teams, you know, the rest of them caught one, two, or three fish. You know. But there was still fish to be caught, and they still gave away all that money. <laughs> okay? So that's, again, you know, I, and I even been down to, like, uh, Bold Shoals, Arkansas. Anybody been down there and walleye fish? That's a tough reservoir to, to fish during the day. It's a, it's a reservoir with a lot of trees in it and a lot of gravel. It's real, real clear. I mean, you can go out there at night and see all the eyes. I mean, we thought there weren't any walleyes in there until we went down there at night and we started spotlighting them, you know, and then you see all the eyes all, you know, running around. So there's a lot of walleyes in there just that they were all feeding at night. And what we found is that uh, I mean, there was like four or five of us down there that were kind of rooming together and trying to figure out what was going on. And then we had like uh, six days of practice and then three days of the tournament. So out of six days, we had five guys. So five guys times six is 30 man days on the water. We didn't catch a fish. None of us caught one walleye in six days, five guys. That's 30 man days without a walleye. So you're thinking it's a tough bite. <laughs> that was a tough bite, right? You should have seen the first day of that tournament. I, I, and I, what I decided to do, I was going to troll, because I was seeing fish, you know, kind of about 30 to 40 feet down over the tops of the trees. So we, I dragged uh, lead core with crankbaits and I ran them right over the tops of the trees. And I mean, first. 20 minutes of the tournament, boom, you know, the ride goes back, real life fish in, four and a half pound walleye, and I mean, you should have seen me screaming. I mean, I thought I'd just won the tournament, you know, after six days of no fish, you know. So, and, and actually, as it turned out, you know, that one, that's the only fish I caught in three days of the tournament, and I ended up like in sixth place. One four and a half pounder. But, uh, you know, so, I don't know, I, I guess I, I just look at it as that, you know, just keep on moving, trying different things until, you know, you catch one fish and sometimes it makes a difference. Oh, there was another one. My second tournament I would have fished. You know, the first one was Mud Bowl 1, we didn't catch nothing, all right, but we were tied for, for 13th place or whatever it was, all right. My second tournament I fished was uh, Lake Muskegon. It's, uh, it's a little lake off of Lake Michigan. Okay, it's a, again a notorious night, night bite fishery. And uh, we spent two days there, didn't, didn't, didn't catch anything, but you know, we were fishing these little pilings. They're, it's it's kind of like a shipping lake, you know, because it's connected to Lake Michigan. So some of these big ships come in there and there's big pilings all standing up and 
you know, kind of dark inside there, and we were just kind of trolling spinner rigs right around this thing. And back then, I didn't know really nothing about life. It was only my second tournament I ever fished. So we were working around these pilings, you know, and all of a sudden I get this boom, boom, boom. Oh, Johnny, I got one, and then boom, it comes off. And I said, Johnny, that's a, that was a walleye. I know that was a walleye, you know, because we didn't have anything the day before that. And this is the second, we, back then, I just, just uh, graduated from college, you know, and we didn't have much money, so we would, uh, we would camp, you know, we'd pitch a tent and drive out there. We just bought this little, what was about an 18-foot tiller boat, you know, with a 50-horse tiller motor on the back, and, you know, we didn't have much money, so we would tent, we would eat sandwiches, we would go practice at the weekend before the tournament started, and then one day before the, turn, the weekend tournament, we would practice, and then the tournament would be the Saturday and Sunday. Well, the, the weekend before that particular Muskegon tournament, we didn't catch anything the, the two days before, the, the weekend before, and then we went out there again the day before the tournament started and started practicing, and then we went out around these little pilings, and all of a sudden, you know, I get this bite, he comes off, I said, Johnny, I know that's, I know that's a walleye, <laughs> you know. I mean, he come off, we didn't even see it, you know. So the next day, we go out to that same spot, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. We had like three walleyes, about three and a half pounds, or two pounds, two and a half, three, three pounds, something like that a piece. I mean, three of them, boom, boom, boom. We didn't catch another thing for the next, for the rest of the day, or the second day. We ended up like in third place with three fish, you know, just on a bite, <laughs> you know. I mean, but we really didn't have anything else to go on, so, you know, we had to go back to that spot, you know. But, uh, but that's how tough bites are, you know. I mean, you just, you just have to keep telling yourself that the fish are biting, they're biting somewhere, we got to figure out what it is that they're biting on. So, uh, well, that's a lot of good stories, I guess. I, you know, I'd, I'd love to get any questions, you know. I don't want to... Yes? Oh, okay, sure enough. Lake Winnebago. Lake Winnebago system. That is a... That can be a real bugger in, in September. It's a, it's a tough, tough bite in September. Uh, in June, you can go out there and catch fish all the time. Um, when Brian, you were there, it wasn't easy, was it? <laughs> you know, you know, it's not easy. It's not a great bite when you got sixty-something guys, and three of them didn't catch a fish for two days or three days. It was a three-day term. Yeah, so there was like three guys that didn't catch a fish for three days, and then. A bunch of them with one fish, and a bunch of them with two fish, and a bunch of them with three or four or five, you know, and, and the limit each day um, was five fish a day, wasn't it? I think it was five fish a day we could bring in, okay? So that's a tough tournament when you have that much of a spread from first place all the way down to, to last. And uh, that particular tournament, um, you know, I found some, some fish casting up in, in Butamore, uh, which are these little lakes that are off of, the, the Fox River kind of comes through, and you have Poygan, Butamore, um, and then they dump all, the Fox River comes in and dumps into Lake Winnebago. And we were, we were launching right at the mouth of the Fox River on Lake Winnebago. So you can go into Lake Winnebago, you can go up into a, these small little lakes coming up, and uh, I found a I found a few fish casting up in Butamore during practice, and then also found a few fish in Lake Winnebago during practice, which is 10 miles this way in Lake Winnebago, and another 15 miles back that way through some little lakes, and then also found a few smaller fish south south on Lake, Lake Winnebago. So all my spots that I kind of found fish. You know, one was 15, 10, and then about eight. All in different directions, you know. And they were all in three different kind of techniques. I was casting crankbaits up in Butamore, trolling 
lead core on the east shore of Lake Winnebago, and then um, just uh, flatlining on these reefs on the south end of Lake Winnebago. So you can obviously imagine, you know, first day to determine what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, do I go to Unimore? Do I go to Lake Winnebago? Do I go south? You know, uh, the first day I decided, all right, I'm going to go out and catch. Go, go where the big fish, you know, because I caught bigger fish out on the east side of Lake Winnebago. So the first day, I go running out, and actually I caught one 24-inch right on the mouth of where we were launching. So I just said, all right, we're going to go, we're going to make a few casts right up, right, right by the launch ramp, because, you know, we always drive past, you know, you got to drive 100 miles when all the fish are, like, real close, right? So I thought, well, We'll make a few class casts real close. So we did that for about 20 minutes and nothing. So, okay, let's go on the other side of Lake Winnebago, 10 miles away. So we went out there and started trolling, and I couldn't get my kicker to start for some reason. You know, I even had I even had the kill switch on. <laughs> you ever done that? Get to some place and your kill switch is dead. <laughs> Damn engine. <laughs> No, but I, it turns out, you know, I, when I got back in that evening, you know, it was this followed spark plug. But I didn't know that out in the boat, you know. So I'm sitting there trying to get the thing to start, start, it won't start. So I put up the big engine, the 250, and I start trolling. And we put the lead core out, trolling crankbaits, and I go, in, out of here, in, out of here. And it sort of go, two and a half. One and a half, three, one and a quarter. You know, I mean, I'm going up and down, which is great because you know you changing up speed. But the problem with speed in lead core is that the lead core will drop and then get hung up in the rocks and then speed up, then drop down in the rocks and then you get hang up. And I mean, after about an hour of that, maybe an hour and a half, I'm going to my partner. I says, this isn't going to work. And I can tell. See, these are all pro am tournaments. So you, you know, let's say you were, t you know, you a co a co angler, okay, and teamed up with me. You know, you would get in my boat for that day, and we would talk about what we're going to do and how we're going to catch fish. Well, my co angler that day, when we first started casting into this shoreline right by the launch ramp, I could tell that guy he was he was good. I mean, he could whip a crankbait out, put it right on the shore, and when he could reel it in, I, I could tell right away that it was good caster. All right. So when we were out there trolling, I couldn't get the speed right, and I wasn't really feeling good about, we didn't catch anything either, so after about two hour and a half, two hours maybe, got to be about mm, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. It was then I said, <laughs> we, we, we can't sit here the rest of the day. So we pulled everything up, went 10 miles back towards the long tramp, another it was at least uh, 20 minutes to get back to the launch ramp, and then probably another half an hour to get up to Butamore through the no wakes, through the river, and through all the channels and everything else to get to the other spot. So I knew it was going to be at least almost an hour from 11, and we wouldn't even start fishing until 12. So we got up to Butamore at 12, we started casting it, boom, boom, boom. We had like four fish right away, couldn't get that last fish, and then I had to weigh in at three. So caught all our fish casting up in Butamore that first day. Now the second day, all right, so what would you do on the second day? You'd start casting, right? So I go up to Butamore, start casting. Now my, I got a different co-angler that day, and I tell right away that he was putting a couple of crankbaits up in the trees. <laughs> so after about two and a half hours of that, you know, and I can tell it was a little bit different day too. Um, the first day we had a little bit more wind and the wind was blowing into the shoreline and that's, we caught the fish pretty quick, you know. The second day the wind was a little bit different direction and it was a little bit calmer in there. Plus, like I said, we had to get a few crankbaits out of the trees, and they were only in one little stretch of shoreline. 
And so after about two hours of that, I said, we gotta go, right? So now we pull up, go 30 miles through the river, and then another 20 miles past that, past the long side, out to the east side again. Started trolling crankbaits. Now he was he was great setting lines, you know, that was not a problem. We can we we were trolling. I had my my kicker motor was fixed, I had my speed just right. Now this is a great tip, because you know, through all of this, you know, I gotta throw out something that's gonna help everybody, right? This is absolutely if you troll lead core and you wanna stay on a contour, because what we were doing, we were contour trolling. We had to be in you, know, you either pick five to seven foot of water, or eight to ten foot of water, or ten to twelve foot of water when you're trolling lead core, all right? And you want to kind of maintain a certain speed so that the, the lead core doesn't drag the crankbaits down. Okay? This tip, I think, is absolutely the best boat control tip I can give you. Okay? This is called the push-pull method of boat control. I put my Trova down and I put the kicker down. I get the kicker started and I get put that in the gear and then I turn on the Trova and I put the Trova at about a five power, you know, because I got a remote control. I can control it from anywhere in the boat. And I get the speed kind of turned up with my kicker so that, you know, if I want to be at two mile an hour, I got the kicker going at about 1.6 and then the electric trolling motor will take up the rest. But what that does is that I can stay on a contour line that's eight foot precisely, okay? What, what's the toughest wind to try to troll in and stay on a certain brake line? If you're trolling like this and you've got a wind that's blowing the nose of your bolt this way, right? So let's say, let's say we weren't using that troll on the bow to control the front end of the bolt. What happened? As you're trolling with the rear end, just with the kicker, or a lot of people I talk to, you know, there's a walleye club in Sioux Falls, and they like to troll. And what they do is they got the, the little kicker motor tied into their big motor, and they sit there at the console, and they turn like this, right? They troll, that's what they call trolling. Well, let's say you're doing that, you got a, and you're staying on this contour line right here, and all of a sudden the wind's blowing the nose of that bolt, this way. What do you have to do? You have to turn the engines that way to get the rear end of the bolt to turn around and go back up this way, right? By that time, you're in six foot of water if you were wanting to be in eight foot of water, right? So you, the bolt, what happens, the nose of the bolt, it's kind of like a car on ice. It's just sliding back like this, and then boom, you're past the eight foot. Now you're in 10 foot. Then you let the wind drift you back into eight foot. Oh, so now you're back in six foot, you slide the boat back this way, right? Now, envision the Trova, right? And I, got, I put it on the autopilot or the GPS north, you know, button. What the GPS does, what it does, it just keeps that nose pointed kind of out towards the wind, right? So the boat works best when it's pulled, so I've got a push with the kicker, pull with the, with the trolling motor. There's, and then with the hummingbirds, they got, they got this little, they got the contour lines, right? They got the Lake Master one foot contour lines and a lot of these different lakes, right? And what I do is they've got this highlight feature. I can take the 10 to 12 foot zone and highlight it in green. And man, I mean, I'm sitting there looking at my electronics. I can keep that boat right on that 10 to 12 foot contour because it's like following the yellow brick road, only it's green, okay? I mean, there is absolutely no better way to control your boat than with this push-pull motor. I, I've tried them all, believe me. I've tried them all. It is just, it is, anybody that, that trolls lead core or wants to stay or troll on a, on a certain depth brake line or contour, that's the way to do it. So to make a long story short, back to the Lake Winnebago story, we finally get out of, troll, of casting, we go back out to the east side, we start trolling, boom, boom, boom. I mean like a 24, a 22, a 19, you know what I mean? We had a lot of really decent fish for this tournament, you know? So that got me into the third day. 
Um, caught our five fish. And uh, actually, no, we only had four. We had four the first day, four the second day, but they were nicer fish on the second day, but it was enough to put me in the top 10. So then the third day, what would you do on the third day if you were me? Troll, right? So that's what I did. I went out, and the third day was, um, was a, just went out there 10 miles out east to, on Lake Winnebago. Okay? Got out there, and I mean, we started trolling. This is the top 10. Started trolling my first spot where I caught all the fish, the four fish the day before. And um, nothing. <laughs> it was dead. So I just kept on moving down the shoreline, and then there was another little. See, we were fishing these points, right? They're real rocky. It's a real rocky shoreline on the east side of Lake Winnebago. We're trolling these points, trying to stay in that eight, eight foot, basically eight foot contour line around these points. So we're following the point. And the first day I caught the fish right on the inside turn of the point. All right? Why do fish like points? You ever th think about that? I, I think about a lot of things when you got a lot of time on the water, right? So, why do fish travel along these points? I think they collect on these points because they, to get from point A to point B, they go like this, and all of a sudden, boom, they hit a roadblock, right? So they collect on those inside turns, and then the active fish go out to the tips of the points, right? That's where you, you find a lot, good concentration of fish out of the tips, and then boom, they use contour lines just like high, like we use highways to get from point A to point B. So they just kind of work along these, these contour lines, boom, inside turns and collection point. The tips of the points are collection points and the other inside turn. That's why these points are so good. Structure, is, structure collects these fish. So the third day I go out there, work this tip of the point, nothing, and then Worked the inside turn where I caught the fish the day before, nothing. And then there was another little point a little bit further down the shoreline. So after I did this a couple, three times and nothing, got to be about 10, well, about, well, no, this day was about two hours of trolling the point, that main, the main spot where I caught the fish, about two hours worth, nothing. So I said, well, I'm just keep on going down the shoreline. And there's another little, small little point down the shoreline. Get around there, boom, like a 21 inch. All right, <laughs> this is it. All right, so I come back around again through there, boom, a 26 incher. Now, I got nine pounds in the first two and a half, three hours of the day. I'm thinking, this is a 25 pound day. You know, and could I catch another fish for the next three hours? <laughs> Not another fish in the next three hours. So it's getting to be about. 1, 1 1.30, and we got to be in at 3, 3.30. I got like two hours of fishing left. I, only, I, I got two really nice fish that are going to go to waste, all right, if I don't catch another. So now I'm way on the east side. I got to go another 10 to 12 miles south to get the south, south spot where the numbers are. So I go down there where the reefs are, and I start just flatlining crankbaits. On these, on these reefs, and I mean, by that time, the wind's kind of blowing and it's raining, and you know, throw the crankbaits out, and then boom, 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 catch three fish and go in on the wind. <laughs> so they weren't big, they were just little ones, but they were enough to put me in the sixth place. So, to make a long story short, that was my Lake Winnebago experience. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, well, yes. You talked about your refinements and bobber fishing. You know, I know you fish Malax a lot, it's very good. You fish Devil Lake a lot, had good success up there. Can you talk a little bit about at times you're using plane hooks, sometimes you're using little jigs and your setup, how heavy a line for this water, that water? Are you always using leeches? Uh well, you know, I mean every single lake has got a little bit different characteristics to it, you know, I mean Certainly, as Minnesota lakes, I think the leeches uh, work really well, obviously. I, I like using small little jigs to start off with, you know. Um, when we were fishing Devil's Lake a lot, you know, a plain hook would often work well, too. Or, you know, like 
in, in states where you can have two line or two hooks per line, I'd put a, a jig down on the bottom, small jig on the bottom, and then about a foot and a half above, I'd put what they call a standout jig or a hook. And so you could actually have a hook, a jig on the bottom, and then this little hook. It's kind of like a drop shot hook. Anybody heard of when you drop shot, you know, for bass? You do the same thing here. You just tie another hook a little bit further up. And I catch a lot of fish just, you know, on that top hook. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, whether a jig or a plain hook, I mean, usually what I always do is we've got, you know, that's why kind of walleye fishing is kind of a fun sport because it's kind of a community sport. The more guys in the boat, usually the better because if you're all jigging, everybody's going to have a different color to start off with. Or if you're trolling crankbaits, you're going to have all different colors and maybe a couple different styles of crankbaits to start off with. Right? I call it kind of like setting out a smorgasbord and then letting the fish pick out what they want. You know, in fact, I got a, a good friend way back home in Illinois. You know, this guy is like, he's a big dude, about six foot four, six foot five, 350 pounds. You know, when I take him to a smorgasbord, you should see him. His jaw, all that, and then he starts salivating and it's dripping down the sides, you know, and he's already got it picked out. He says, I'm going to get six of these, ten of those, twenty of this, six of them, you know. He's got it, got it all lined up. So what we do, you know, as walleye fishermen, is that we set out a smorgasbord and then let the fish start picking out what they want. And then once you figure out what they want, you just keep giving them more of it, okay? So, I always, I always say, you know, I mean, just like this Winnebago tournament, I mean, I had three different techniques, three different spots, and I had to use every single one of them to catch fish. Same thing with crankbaits, you know. Let's say you're trolling crankbaits on Erie, you know, you want to put one down six feet down, one ten foot, one twelve, one fifteen, you know, just stagger all the depths, different crankbaits, maybe a deep diving husky jerk and then a reef runner, different colors, you know, throw out the boards and then start letting the fish tell you what they want. When you get, get a bite, you try to figure out, all right, is it the speed? Is it the depth where the crankbaits are? Is it the action of the crankbait? Is it the color, right? And you start making adjustments from there. I had one tournament out in Saginaw Bay many years ago with me and Johnny. Um, we were trolling spinners, you know, suspended, and then when the, when the clouds would come in, they wanted fluorescent blades, so we'd switch them all out. And then when the clouds would disappear and the sun comes out, they wanted metallic, so then we'd switch them out again. So if you're running four baits, what we would do, when it's cloudy, we'd run three fluorescents, one metallic. And then when it, when it got sunny, we'd put three metallics and keep one fluorescent. You know, just to kind of make sure that, you know, if they switched again, you know, and you start catching all the fish on the opposite color, that we know that, you know. So, so yeah, you know, when it comes to, you know, leeches versus crawlers, jig versus a hook, I, I say change it all up. Have everybody try something different until you let the fish tell you what they want, right? And then as far as pound test line, I mean, I always, when I read these slip bobbers, I, I use a super braid, like a, a 10 pound test uh, tough line is what I use, right, for, the, for their main line. And then if you're walleye fishing, you know, six pound fluorocarbon for, the, for that, or maybe an eight, eight pound fluorocarbon. Okay, and then like I said, you know, when it comes to, if it's a real tough bite, sometimes you might even have to go to, this is really a crappie bluegill jig on here, but sometimes you have to go down to a, a 16th ounce jig, you know, or a plain hook to get, get the fish to bite. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Scott. Remember what I said at the beginning, I said, slow down, downsize. If that doesn't work, then get, 
then change up again, and then go after that reaction rate. You know, now what does a small jig? Now see it. If I was doing a jigging seminar, I'd talk about make sure that you use enough weight to maintain bottom contact because the fish are on the bottom. That you know, when when those high pressure systems come and uh, and the fish they start dropping, they're 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 laying. When you can't mark them, they're laying belly to the bottom. They, I don't believe that they've moved. They just drop down and they don't move for nothing. Okay, they're just inactive for the most part. So. You either have to keep that bait in front of them for a longer period of time, or you have to get them trigger trigger a reaction strike. Now, when it comes to smaller jigs, it forces you to slow down. Okay, it forces you to watch your line as you, as that jig is dropping. You got to watch your line, and then when that line goes limp on the surface, now you you know you're on the bottom. But that's where you got to be really careful because. You know, first of all, it's location. And location is not just the spot. It's where they are. You know, are they suspended? Are they down at the bottom? Where are they at? And what do you use it? Okay. So when it comes to jig fishing, and you use it, they always say small, light jigs, light jigs, light jigs, because, you know, they can inhale the jig better. That's true, but if you're using an eight ounce jig in five mile an hour current with 25 mile an hour winds and and waves going like this you can't get a 16 ounce jig down 25 feet you know so you're not only in the right location you're not in the right spot where the fish are so when it comes to lighter jigs you you've got to you can't always say i'm going to use a 16th or an eighth ounce jig is what i'm saying Okay? All right, great question. Any others? All right. Well, I tell you what, I hope everybody enjoyed it. I had a great time. Um, thank you very much for coming out this evening. And uh, I'll stick around. 